sketch actually is. It's an endemic disease, and we know about it here, um, way up here, but, but it's actually a Western Hemisphere disease, so it actually occurs in many other parts of the uh, North America, South America, Central America. It just doesn't show that, but there are pockets in Central America. Actually, the first case of valley fever, coccidioidomycosis, uh, occurred in Argentina uh, over a century ago, 1893. Um, uh, the, the other point I wanted to make with this slide, though, is that pretty much most of those areas that are in yellow um, are pretty rural areas. Um, and if we blow it up to uh, a more uh, focused area in northern uh, Mexico or uh, Mexico and the southwest here, um, it's actually true pretty much for most of that area as well, um, except, of course, uh, kind of where we live. Uh, and this is, I like this slide very much as an Arizonan's view of the United States. Um, <laughs> if you sort of see the, the overemphasis about our state uh, here. But for this disease, I think it's really quite appropriate because two-thirds of all U.S. infections of valley fever occur in Arizona. Two out of three in Arizona. So, in fact, most of that occurs in the three counties of Pima, Canal, and Maricopa County. So you can think of that really as the valley fever border uh, for the United States. Uh, we live there. Uh, so this is uh, looking up at the Catalinas. Um, and uh, in some parts of the dirt around us, um, the arthrocnidia, or the spore of the fungus, coccidioides, uh, shown here by a scanning EM. This, this is a single spore. It's about the same size as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, three to five microns. It's a very nice size if you inhale it to go all the way into your lungs and not to get exhaled. So it's, it's a very good delivery device for infection. And, and if you get infected, um, you will develop, by definition, a respiratory tract infection or a pneumonia. This is somebody who has a pretty striking pneumonia. Uh, and you can't tell that really from any other kind of pneumonia. Ken will be, Ken Knox will be discussing that, I'm sure, uh, in part of his remarks. And if you actually looked at parts of that lung under a microscope, you'd see this. This, this is very different from this. This is a spherule. It's, it's uh, instead of three to five microns, it's now grown to be 30 to 70 microns. It's still very, very small, microscopic. You have to look under a microscope to see it. But inside, there's literally a hundred or more progeny called endospores. And when this thing pops every four days, is about its cell cycle length, you release two log amplification of the original spore that caused the infection. So just in overall numbers, what we see as an impact here in Arizona is there's roughly 100,000 infections per year. Um, that varies, and, and Heidi's going to talk to us about that uh, quite a bit. Uh, in the first presentation. Not all of those infections uh, develop an illness. Probably about a third uh, actually uh, seek medical attention because they have a pneumonia or some other syndrome uh, caused by this infection. And a subset of those that seek medical attention actually get diagnosed. A lot of them don't get diagnosed um, um, because the doctor doesn't think to do that or because the diagnostic tests are unsatisfactory. Um, but then uh, some do get diagnosed, and then of that, a smaller number still, we think roughly 400 a year, develop this infection not just staying in the lungs, but going all around the body to other parts, brain, bones, skin. We call that disseminated infection. And an even smaller number actually die of this. It can cause death, but it's of the 100,000 uh, per year uh, that get infected, maybe one-tenth of one percent of that uh, go on to actually die of this infection. So, so those are kind of the numbers, and this is considered pretty much the, the mild form of the disease, but uh, um, diagnosed uh, disease, we now know from Arizona Department of Health Services data that, that it's anything but mild. 75% um, uh, of workers lost, uh, um, stopped working, and half of them lost greater than uh, two weeks. Um, uh, Illness lasted, in general, more than six months for half of the patients. And 40% uh, were hospitalized. And recent data, I just saw it come out this week for 2012, 
indicated that hospital costs are now up to $100 million a year. And there's another publication from California that says that their hospital costs uh, per year are a couple hundred million a year. So between the two states alone, you have in hospital costs $0.3 billion per year. Uh, that doesn't take into account uh, time lost work or uh, outpatient uh, care, which is also quite considerable. So there, there really is quite a financial burden. And then this much smaller number has major morbidity and consequences. So these are just pictures of people with extra pulmonary spread. This is, these are abscesses on a fellow's back um, that were really fluctuating, just like Staph aureus bacterial infection uh, when they drained, but they were caused by uh, this fungus. And, and here, this is an uh, image of, uh, of the, the spine of a person who has, this is the normal part, this is the spinal cord, you want to have one of those. But this little thing here is an abscess. These are all abscesses. This was actually a continuous anterior cervical abscess from, from the, the cervical vertebral column all the way down the mid chest. So these are very complicated infections, get very multidisciplinary, and those patients can be very sick for very long periods of time. This is actually what's going on with cases reported. This was a high of 16,000 cases reported in 2011. Um, but what I don't think people have really seen covered in the news have been that it's come down in 2012, and although we haven't finished 2013 yet, estimates look like it's come down to roughly 8,000 from 16. So we half the number of cases in the last two years, which begs the question: really, what could be causing these kinds of changes? You know, um, they go up and they go down. What is it? And, um, and we're going to actually start with that question in mind. Um, Heidi Brown is a climatologist in the uh, College of Public Health, uh, and uh, she's going to address uh, actually some very significant influences of the weather on the new year uh, changes uh, in, in valley fever case rates. Second, we'll talk with Ken Knox, who's here with me, uh, to talk about pulmonary toxicomycosis, a lung doctor's perspective, but the announcements had, it was a blood doctor, I think it was, but we, we got the correction in. At, he's a pulmonary physician, he's head of the division of pulmonary here at uh, University Medical Center at University of Arizona. And then we'll have a break. After each of these uh, speakers, we'll have time for, um, for questions. And um, I suspect that probably they won't, um, they won't uh, be staying for the whole rest of the time because at the end we'll have a, a roundup period of time for questions as well, but that probably will be mostly for the third, fourth uh, speakers. And, and those will be uh, my good friend Lisa Schubitz, veterinarian, will talk about the pet connection, valley fever in animals, and finally I have some other thoughts I'd like to bring to you as the final discussion for the afternoon. Um, in addition to all of us here, we're also uh, delighted to have join us uh, uh, Congressman David Schweiker, who uh, is uh, uh, co-chair of uh, the newly formed Congressional um, uh, Task Force on Valley Fever, along with uh, Kevin McCarthy, the congressman from Bakersfield, or the Bakersfield area. And I'm delighted that uh, Congressman Schweiker can join us today. He, uh, he and uh, Congressman McCarthy are bringing increasing visibility in the federal arena to this disease, and I think it's very appropriate, and, and thank you for your time. Um, we'll, um, I'm sure uh, either at the break you'll have time to ask some questions, or perhaps um, later on in the afternoon as we, we go through it, as well as for the, the people that are doing the presentations. So let me uh, end then, and, and um, Heidi, why don't you come up, and we'll see if we can find you on this, um, on the desktop here. Here's your driver, and I'll give you the this, uh, this, uh, mic right now. Projecting. 
the row in my projection? Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so um, thanks for that introduction. I'm really glad to see everybody here. There's a fairly good chance I'm going to trip over this cord because um, I walk around a bit. Um, I'm Heidi. I'm oh, right across the street, right across the way here. I'm in, uh, in the College of Public Health. I'm actually a vector-borne disease epidemiologist. And what in particular I look at is disease patterns, where they're occurring and why they're occurring, and when are they coming out. So I'm really interested in seasonality. And as a result of that, climate becomes a huge issue for me because it usually dictates when mosquitoes are coming out, when they're, why they are where they are. Um, John and I probably should have coordinated our slides. I think there's at least one picture that we both have the same one of. Um, but that issue of where the, where the disease is, is occurring becomes a really important one for me. So we have a little bit of overlap of the distribution, but I'll make the argument that weather has a big part of why that is where it is. Um, just to make sure I don't have any slides with anything on there that I haven't explained to you. Um, and I'm fairly decent on being interrupted with questions. So if you want, like, don't get lost because I've said something too quickly. Just stop me and I'll rewind for you. Um, but what we're looking across the bottom is we're looking at this fungus and how it's growing, walking across from the immature phase. Um, and as it dries out in the spores, which we already got a nice little brief overview of. That's the good one. There we go. All right, so just briefly where I'm going to go, that the when is going to be the slides. You've seen at least one of already. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about where it is and why it is where it is. Um, and specifically this notion of the lower sonor life zone, which I like, and that's okay. us. We own, we own it whether we want it or not, right? Um, we'll talk about when, um, that seasonality, when the disease is occurring, when we see cases, and try to get into some of the whys about why that is. I'll talk about the grow and glow hypothesis that you might have heard. And then as an epidemiologist, we always talk about who are the susceptible individuals and how that also affects where we're seeing it, when we're seeing it, and these kind of factors. Um, and then I, to keep my questions on, I did the so what, um, which is what are we going to do with this information? Which is we have a lot of information, and I'm unfortunately not going to give you as many answers as you want me to, um, but I'm going to give you some good food for thought and sort of issues of where we'd like to go with it. And that's what my, that's what my so what is. So this is where we're going today. Um, so that's my one. It's almost the identical of your red one, so sorry about that. Um, but I kind of, we're going to we're gonna zoom in and talk about it. Um, so as was already mentioned, it's I'm glad a, you didn't show all sorts of spots that I didn't on that. Yeah, I know. It's a really consistent map, right? <laughs> Notice that his was actually from, I think, 2005, 2006. This one's from 1970. Um, so that, that, you know, we haven't... It's still where it was. Um, the, the color, the added color, is pretty much the only difference between our two maps. Um, but again, it's, um, it's, it's our disease. We own it in North Central South America. Um, it's named from the San, jo uh, San Joaquin Valley. Um, where it was first sort of identified and recognized of, of what we're talking about and grouped together. Um, usually rural, we already got the, just like Tucson and Maricopa, um, yeah, not so much. Um, but it's usually thought of as a more rural disease. But that just kind of brings us into where we're looking at it. All right, zooming in, almost this identical map, also very similar, um, but kind of looking at it. Uh, whether we want to or not, we own this disease, especially here in Arizona. We have about 66% of the cases um, based on CDC reports. Uh, this lower Sonoran life zone was first kind of brought up in the uh, late 50s, which is trying to understand where this disease is and why it is in the places that it is. And what it seemed to be is um, you could find an association with the soil type. So we're talking about a soil growing fungus, so that kind of makes sense. And the soils that are associated with this lower, lower Sonoran life zone tend to be associated with this fungus. However, that's a, a narrower definition than it needs to be, as you've seen. You know, it's moving out into areas that are beyond our, our soil cactus. And, um, but it's a kind of a, so at least a starting place. And it is found in some of the semi-arid places as we're going along. So that's kind of, you know, getting us into this, what's, what's driving it. So we're looking at soil types that are driving it, and we're also getting into this semi-air, there's something on the weather that's having an influence on what's going on and where the disease is. All right, so zooming in a little bit further, um, we're actually looking at cattle here, um, but the human, for better or for worse, we look a lot like cows. Um, <laughs> this is, yeah, <laughs> sometimes, right? So this is looking at five to six-year-old cattle and looking that, you know, long enough out there exposing themselves um, seemed to be really related to what we were seeing in humans that had been in the area for at least 12 years. Um, so what we're looking at, and I kind of put that in is because 
the first map, it was kind of all of Arizona, right? And then we're still kind of most of Arizona. And now you're starting to get into this, well, there's, there's still pockets, right? So the gray areas is sort of where it's kind of estimated that this pathogen is growing. And we're getting some pockets of where it's not growing as well. Um, and it, it doesn't, which is what we want to hear. Like, why is it not growing in these places, but it's not growing? And what is it about those areas? Um, and so this is when the this is when the distribution of the wear starts to get into that kind of pieces of when and what's going on. Um, so it seems to be areas where we have this sterilizing heat, where we're getting enough heat that's knocking back a lot of the competitors for this fungus, so that it's kind of the only one out there growing in the soil. Um, we're looking at areas that are hot and dry. If you're familiar with it, if you're familiar with Tucson, we got a lot of hot and dry. You're familiar with the disease. We have this association of when it kind of dries it out, and, and then the, the spores get blown and it starts moving around. Um, so that sterilizing heat to dry out the fungus so that the spore, it, the, we get these spores that can then be aerosolized, but also that it's having this effect where it's reducing the competitors for this fungus. And then we need some rain. We need some rain so that this fungus can grow and proliferate and get out and you know, do what it wants to do. So we have rain, and then we need that wind. We need that wind in there that picks it up and blows it, unfortunately, up our noses and into our lungs. And so those are kind of the three things that we're thinking about. It's got to be something about this area that's going to be hot. It's going to be something about these areas where you get the rain. The question that you're hopefully all asking is, well, how much rain do you need? And when does that rain fall? I'm not going to answer that because I don't know. <laughs> Wish we did. But that kind of having rain at the right time Having this cycle of where you're getting heating, drying it out, wetting it, letting it grow, getting it so that it aerosolizes and blows. These are all factors that we need in these areas where we're going to find this disease. All right, so that's kind of our when, or sorry, that's kind of our where area, giving us an idea of where this disease is happening. Let's talk a little bit about when. Um, I like this slide. It's, it's stolen from the 1950s. Uh, again, this, another side note that's fascinating about this disease, when you're looking into the... Um, the, the wares of this disease and that kind of thing. There's a lot of research that was done on it in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and then we kind of have this pause, and then there's been a rebirth in recent years where we're really trying to get a good handle of what's going on with the disease in terms of these factors. The medical literature is consistent all the way across where they're always trying to figure out what's going on inside the patients, which is, for me, an interesting kind of thing. But what we're looking at here is um, we're getting... A, Pointer. I probably pushed the button I wasn't supposed to. Sorry about that. All right. I'm going to walk over to it because I'm going to lose it again. Anyway, so up in the top, you can read the words. Um, so first, we're talking again about that sun. We're having that area, maximum summer, where it's really drying out and what we're drying out the area. And growing it, I want you to notice two things, rodent hole and creosote bush. We had some in the picture that you had. Um, there seems to be an association when we're trying to look at that microclimate, that micro area of where it's happening, seems to be an association with rodent holes and with creosote. It's kind of the strength of that. It's a, we'll talk a bit more. It's a difficult pathogen to find when it's out there. Um, we get the rainy season, June, July, August. That's when we start getting this proliferation. We're getting the growth of the fungus. And then we get into this dust storms and wind, sort of like right now, right? We keep getting these dust warnings when you're driving down the highway. Um, so that's when it's pulling out and blowing it up. What we see here, um, again, this is from the, the, early, the 50s, 60s. We're, we're looking, there was a lot of issue with ag. So people going out in the fields, you know, actively involved in close to the dirt in addition to these times when it's blowing is your susceptible individuals getting them exposed. And then we get our, in, our incubation period, and then we start having our cases later in the winter. Okay? Just kind of walking through it. Um, seasonality. Um, another piece about this disease, which is challenging and interesting, is depending upon where you are, you get a different picture in terms of the seasonality. Um, but what we're kind of looking at here, um, this is CDC data looking at from uh, 98 through the only 2001, but kind of seeing this winter season that we're seeing a little bit more of this kind of driving it. It flows from what we were just looking at that we've gone through our cycle and we get these diseases happening a little bit. Later. All right. Hopefully not over time. Still trying to get back to this 
So the precipitation is helping us with this grow phase, and then we're getting into the glow phase. Um, so this slide is very similar to the previous one um, in terms of the words that are on there. I'm not tall enough for it, but me and technology. Here we go. That's a light, and there's a clean. All right, so we have the, um, the, the fungus in the soil. Um, we're getting high temperatures, low precipitation, sterilizing it, knocking out the competitors. Okay, and then we get increased soil moisture and it starts to grow. Its competitors out there aren't out there. Fungus gets to kind of freely grow in the area. Then we have our drying out period, spore formation, and then we start getting into our blow period. Where it's, it's been dried out, it was happily growing with no competitors, it's drying out now and we get the wind picking up and it gets um, dispersed, inhaled, and that's when we start seeing our, our cases happen. All right, so a little bit of data behind it, a little bit of what's it. So again, it's sort of the third slide, but we're kind of thinking about it in a slightly different way here. What we're, we're looking at is, with, if we have for this growth period, so when does the precipitation fall? Remember, I, get, I told you to have that question. You're asking me how much precipitation and when does it need to come, right? So we have to have some sort of a, in this growth period, if we have a wet growth period, then the fungus gets to proliferate. And then we have this sort of lag before we start seeing our cases, where all that other stuff has to happen, right? So we get the fungus out there growing in the area, and then we have a lag. So it's by month. So if I have a wet October, November, December, I'm going to expect to see more cases in the following winter season. And if I have a dry one, I'm going to expect to see fewer cases, all right? And then with the blow, the blow is happening sort of much more because of the incubation period. The blow is happening much closer to the time when the patients are starting to appear. So if I have a, a wet period when this blow period is happening, I'm actually going to have a reduction in my cases, right? Because it helps to wash it out of the air or it's, it's not getting that dry out period and it's not blowing around. If I have a dry for that season, that later season, that's when I see my cases. All right? Okay. So what this is, is this is some of the work that was done by Andrew Conrad and one of his graduate students um, looking specifically at that. They use data from both Pima and Maricopa County. And what they're looking at is they're finding an association between precipitation and when that precipitation is occurring and what that's doing to cases. So what we're looking here is in that, in that early October, November, December rain period, if we're having a lot of precipitation here. So this is increasing amount of precipitation. And what we're looking at is exposures. We're looking at the population that we're seeing coming down with cases. And you see a faint sorry, line. What we're doing, what we're looking at is if I have low rain during that previous year's precipitation, October, November, December, I see fewer cases. And if I have a really wet in previous year's winter rains, if I have a previous, I'm seeing more, more cases, right? And then that sort of that, during that growth, during that blow period, what we're looking at here is you see the line that we're going in the opposite direction. So if I have high precipitation in that period where those exposures are happening, where the cases are starting to occur, I'm kind of having that, when I should be blowing, I'm kind of rinsing it out. And I end up with fewer cases as opposed to if I have low precipitation during that low period, I have higher cases. All right? So it's a little bit confusing because we have a lag. We have a lag of when that precipitation is happening that it boosts the cases and when it happens that it reduces the cases. And that lag is a really good question that I'd love to be able to answer. And that's where we get a little bit into the susceptible individuals and what they're doing um, because we humans tend to mess up these systems <laughs> in terms of trying to have a clean signal, especially when you're dealing with these kind of pathogens. Um, this is my dog helping me dig in my garden. You can't see either one of us. <laughs> yes, you guys know enough to know what that means. Um, it, it, I, where I am, I am wearing a mask. <laughs> um, my tomatoes did really well, thanks. Um, but we, you can see this, and you'll see this in the literature, where people, their dogs get exposed because they went out, they went hunting, they're digging in rodent burrows. Again, this idea of rodent burrows is kind of coming up, that whether or not that's sort of a micro area of where something's happening. Um, and you'll see cases happening with that. You'll also see I put a couple of cases in the 50s again, and then also more recently, people out there and exposing themselves in different ways to the pathogen um, 
It's going to have a different effect on what we're seeing in terms, of, certainly in terms of the seasonality of the disease. But it's some of the ways that that we expose ourselves to this disease in addition. Quick question. Sure. Being, being that you talked about a mask. I'm sorry. Being that you mentioned mask. Yeah, I put the, yeah, I put the mask you, mostly because of the dust. Right, but being being that uh, it's so small, to the, how how effective are masks? Um, this I'll leave this to the physicians. Um, okay. My guess is that pro probably at this. I mean, I don't know that we're. Are we going to advocate? I'll let the physician answer. Okay. For me, the mask was mostly because of look at the dust. I just it was pretty, pretty horrible. Okay. The dog didn't have one. Um, but yeah. We don't do, but we'll let the physicians answer on that one. All right, so can we get to the so what, right? So you have lots of hopefully pieces of information that are probably sparking more questions, sorry that I'm giving you answers, but at least it's pieces, and we'll talk about the so what. I like these two quotes. I'll give you a little bit of time to, to kind of uh, have a look at them. This is from the 70s, and the picture unfortunately hasn't changed very much today. But this is kind of getting to that idea of what I was talking about is there's a lot we still don't know about this the, 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 the fungus in the soil, where it is. You know, is my backyard an exploder? Do I have to be exceptionally concerned about it? Or am I in one of those white spots? You know, and why are those white spots where they are on that map a few before, where we were looking at the cattle? Why are those white spots occurring where they are and what's driving it? Um, and, and it's really difficult. Wouldn't it be nice? to just go out and say, this is an area that has it, has the pathogen, and I'm going to treat here. It's really hard to grow this pathogen in the lab, um, let alone to try to figure out in a state like Arizona where it is and where it is, you know, why it is where it is in those specific areas. All right. um, and this is sort of driving home that, um, I guess I like old literature because most of my slides are really old, but I find it fascinating. But this is somebody's backyard. Um, and there was 10 kids that ended up dying of the disease, and they went in to try to figure out, well, where did, this, where did these exposures happen? And what we're looking at here, with great trepidation about my pointer, um, this is a positive, and these are negatives. These, all the minuses are negatives. So, you know, how do, yes, no, yes, no, and just in the backyard, you know, when you're looking at that kind of like how do we figure out exactly where this pathogen is and, and try to be able to answer it? And, and then, you know, if that's one person's backyard, blow that up to the state of Arizona and throw in California for good measure. And again, I told you I'd give you more questions than I would answers. Um, uh, so, so, but, but why? <laughs> right, because here's my positive spin because I want to end on a positive note. What are we going to do if we can find some way of doing that? My job as an epidemiologist, what I like to do is figure out when when are you at greatest risk? Is this going to be the year that's a bad year, or is this going to be the year that's a good year? You know, are we going to have fewer cases this year? Where? Which part of my backyard? Which part of your back? Is it your yard or is it your yard? You know, which areas are we looking at? Is there a way to get a better idea of what's going on in those areas? And then you use these to inform public health. You know, could we get to the point of having an air quality index, comma coxie? You know, like, this is a bad day, this is the day that we don't want to be out there. Um, and if we could get to the point of treating specific areas, um, that's sort of our so what. And I'm going to stop there, hopefully not too much over in my time. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, so I think we'll have time for uh, a few questions at this point, if anyone does. Yes, ma'am. You're saying that there seems to be some sort of a relationship potentially with rowing poles and the, um, the bushes. If we were to eliminate those around our homes, would that potentially help? Um, that's a really good question. Because I'm, I'm out in a rural area, and my animals are dying of valley fever right and left. So I'm just wondering if we clear it more, or because we have more open land, will that create more dust and cause more problems? Um, yeah, that's a really good, so the, the literature that you'll see in terms of the rodent holes is often when you're looking at the dog infections, people tend to, like it went in and it was digging in some of these rodent holes. If, if when people go out and collect um, samples and they're doing the samples, it tends to be that they'll find more positive samples. Like if I go out and you know, check a whole area, my positive samples tend to be closer to these rodent holes. Um, or it's also been associated with the creosote bush in terms of 
you know, what kind of other competitors are being knocked out. Um, I think it's going to be a question of um, getting the right votes and which ones. That association is at least something that we can sort of hang our hat on. I don't know if that's your total answer. Um, I, as a dog owner, I don't know which animals you have, but as a dog owner, I'm really cautious about, like, well, mine can't go off leash because they run away. Um, but um, I think that trying to control them not to let them exposing themselves to rodents would certainly be something I think actively try to do. We'll have love some comments from Lisa Jupiter. Yeah, it should be great. We'll come Wait until the question. afternoon for the animal ones, actually. I mean, um, can I just ask, so how, how much of the year-to-year -year variation that I was showing going on um, do you think this model, the rainfall uh, and its impact, has on that year-to-year -year variation? Um, it seems that based on the models that it's actually a pretty good fit um, in terms of... Um, good meaning 20%, 40%, 80%? Um, so, so talking statistics, 80% of the variance in Maricopa was explained by it. Um, trying to translate that statistics into something that, that we understand better than you know, numbers like that. It seems to, um, the Maricopa model fit better than the Pima model did, um, but both of them were pretty good in terms of explaining it. So if I looked at the previous year's winter's precipitation and the concurrent year's um, lack thereof, I did a pretty good job of being able to predict. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Based on the weather this fall, what do you predict, predict for next year? Um, I can't answer that without looking at a model of really getting the data. I haven't been in Tucson long enough. I'm only a, a recent local um, to know whether or not this was a wet year or a dry year. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, to know whether or not this was a wet year or a dry year. Um, and we haven't, because of the, the unfortunate thing about our model, to be quite honest, is I need the concurrent, right? So I need to know what, what, what's happening right now to be able to predict um, what's happening right now. Um, but at least you should be able to get to the point of saying last year, previous year was more wet, less wet, and therefore if this year is wet, then X will happen. But I don't, I, I don't know Tucson's weather well enough to be able to compare. Other questions? Sorry for skinny here. <laughs> are, you, are you um, so at least in this model, with the way that it's working, we are looking at December, October, November rains in terms of how they're predicting. I assume that you're asking on account of the monsoons, because usually we tend to think of it where the monsoons are giving that really nice wetting um, and, and pulling out and giving it. This model, the way that it ended up working, and it predicted pretty well, um, it seems to be more linked to that previous winter rains and what they were having based on when you're looking at exposure seasons. Question back. Um, uh, do any studies with soil You know, I, I don't in particular. Unfortunately, I'm an epidemiologist, so I look at the people and when the people are happening. Um, there's quite a few groups that do look at the soil. It's just, it's, it's kind of a needle in a haystack factor in terms of trying to go out and say, yes, in this soil with this pH. There have been, again, going back to that nice old literature, there are some really old studies that took it into the um, laboratory and looked at things like humidity and temperature um, and pH and trying to find that sort of an association with it. I think it's still one of those big to be answered questions, partially because it's terribly difficult to really be able to pull it out of the soil and know that you're getting it in these areas. Well, the location uh, and I think along those what would be terribly interesting is to kind of do a comparison between where it's growing here in our soils and how that compares to Texas and then further as you go down into the Americas of what it was look like. But I, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, am I still? You're good. You're okay. good. One, one or two more questions and we'll move on. Um, has public health been thinking about uh, partnering with, with at least one local company or maybe one of the other companies that are looking at airborne pathogens like in real, almost like in real time to uh, look 
putting coxie into that battery of uh, tests that they did in terms of epidemiology. Do we have anything from the county back there that might know off the top of their heads in terms of specifically looking about whether or not public health has been partnering with anybody to kind of pull out aerosols and looking at it? If you guys have an answer, I'll, I know that there are studies where they've looked at trying to pull it out of the air and to try to get this idea, because wouldn't it be awesome to say, we're finding it in our in our air filters now? Do you... We're here with us, um, yes. uh, Chris Tang and uh, Mohammed Khan, both from the Arizona Department of Health Services, and also um, uh, Ryan uh, McCotter. Do you want to make any comments about the, uh, the air sampling work that's been going on for a few years. Uh. Yeah, so we tried to collect samples and air samples. Hold on, we're running you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> the air oh. So we did collect samples, so the air samples, and unfortunately, the species <laughs> 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 is so tiny. Did that, did that get caught? Actually, it turns out that if you do the math in terms of how many breaths, this, I'm sorry, this is sort of a, dying on us. Almost, almost easier to talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, that if you actually figure out how many times people breathe and how many uh, liters you breathe in a breath and how many breaths you take in a minute and how many minutes there are in an hour, in a day, in a year, you end up with pretty astounding volumes of liters. And even what is called high throughput uh, sampling, uh, it's, it's a challenging uh, event. If, if the risk of inhaling the spore is 3% per year times the number of times, so 30 times what we do in a, a year is the number of liters you have to sample to find one spore. And it's, it's actually a pretty challenging kind of thing. Why don't we, why don't we uh, we'll have time uh, later perhaps, uh, but we'll answer, certainly have questions in other time. Why don't we move on to our second speaker? Um, that will be uh, Dr. Kenneth Knox, who as I said is the... <laughs> oh, Shay? Yes. Uh, David, you have a comment? Our world? You're good. <laughs> There's a mic on the podium that you can turn on. That one should turn on a little button, so you can turn this one off. Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> I'm so sorry about the technology. This thing, there is a little button here? Yeah, that's a light. And there, this is the one on the podium. Oh. Sorry about that. All right, so moving right along. Um, let me introduce Ken. Dr. Knox is a division chief uh, of pulmonary division, and this title is shown here. Pulmonary coccidiomycosis among doctors. Is that all right if we just turn off the mic? How do this one works? Does it okay, get a way to find like out? Does this one work a little higher? How about now? No. no. Just speak up. <laughs> that one's cool. This is not true. The whistle is not because it's too bad. The whining noise is a little annoying and distracting. Okay. How about now? Yours is off. Yeah. Very good. I was in a retreat last week, same room, same thing. <laughs> okay, well, John, thank you for asking me to speak today, and thank you, everyone, Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was such a great turnout. I'm Ken Knox. I'm the Division Chief for Pulmonary Care Fair. <clears throat> I, too, am somewhat new to Arizona. I've been here five years. And one of the things that attracted me to Arizona, other than Dr. Galgiani and some of his colleagues, is endemic fungal diseases. And uh, there are other endemic fungal diseases, histoplasmosis in the Midwest, uh, blastomycosis also in the Midwest, uh, and coccidioidomycosis here in the Southwest, often uh, discussed in the same vein, but they're very different as I've uh, experienced here in, in Arizona. 
I'm just going to go through a few patients. Um, I thought that would complement sort of some of the other talks that we uh, have today. And quite frankly, from my perspective, it's the most interesting to talk about the patients that we see, and it's probably more interesting uh, to you to hear what other people are dealing with uh, when they uh, come down with valley fever. I'll use the terms valley fever, coccidioidomycosis, and coxy all interchangeably. Um, there are some small differences, which we may talk about just a little bit as we go along. So the first uh, patient is a 55-year-old male, 55-year-old female. This is sort of how we will we would discuss. I was teaching the fellows or other students who would go through a case just sort of in this format. So bear with me if the format's not 100% uh, what you're familiar with. But it's a 55-year-old female who had a few days of cough and fever, and uh, she basically just felt very crummy. She was a hiker. It was very difficult for her to do her hiking, and that was distressing to her. And uh, let me know if you identify with this at all. It took her over a week to get into clinic. I'm not going to tell you how long over a week to get into the clinic. But she was feeling better by the time she was able to see us in clinic. And when we examined her, her lungs were clear. And uh, of course, is when we don't know exactly what's going on, we blame viruses. Uh, probably a viral uh, infection. Uh, it was getting better. She had blood work at that time because we were concerned enough living in the endemic area to test for valley fever, and it was positive. The blood work that we do is called serology, for those of you who don't know, and it's essentially the body making antibodies to the coccidioides, so we test for those antibodies. And it was positive. Um, we followed her along, and she got better without treatment. It's a relatively simple case, but it, uh, it, it, I think it resonates that some people do very well with valley fever. And this slide hopefully shows that. Um, if you look at this, approximately 60% of patients have no symptoms whatsoever. And we, don't e we won't even know if they've had valley fever. It won't be uh, unless they come to the hospital or to medical attention for some other reason that we actually know whether or not they've had valley fever. Sometimes we'll see residual findings on x-rays and, and CAT scans that suggest that valley fever, uh, they were exposed and infected in the past. But what our patient shows us is that even though about 30% of patients who get exposed to valley fever or toxidioides, uh, they get a pneumonia. Most of them resolve with or without treatment. A couple of them worsen, and I'll show you a patient who did worsen. And then some have these sequelae or residual scars in their lung that tell us that they've been exposed in the past. As Dr. Galgiani mentioned, about 5% get what I call bad disease, disseminated. Uh, sometimes they die from this disease. And then about 5% have the classic valley fever, which essentially is coccidioidomycosis with a rash and arthritis. So what symptoms do I see in my clinic as a lung doctor? Well, we have symptoms that come on very quickly, cough, fever, shortness of breath, uh, pain when you take big breaths, that's called pleurisy or pleuritic chest pain. Those are things that we see often acutely or within days of exposure, if indeed there's an pneumonia present. Then we have chronic symptoms such as night sweats, fatigue, some rashes, some headaches, and weight loss. That can happen if, the, if you have sort of a subacute or chronic uh, infection that lingers. We see that quite often as well. So that's patient one, a relatively straightforward case of someone who got better on their own. <coughs> case number two, or patient number two, is a 22-year-old male who went to the emergency room. Had three weeks of fatigue, and. 22-year-old males are fairly stoic, so it took them three weeks to get to the uh, physician, and of course use the emergency room. That's a political statement, not beyond the scope of this talk. But three weeks of fatigue, now with worsening cough and shortness of breath. He endorsed that maybe he had some low-grade fevers, and the thing that really bothered him and why he knew he was ill is that he really uh, didn't feel like smoking. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. This is a, a thing that we see in the pulmonary clinics, which may be different from infectious disease clinics, is that patients, when they're attached to their cigarettes and they can't smoke, they, they seek attention. <laughs> on exam, his lungs were abnormal. He had an abnormal breast sound on the right side. And this is a, a chest x-ray, which shows you here the abnormality. Just for orientation, I don't know how many people are, how many physicians are in the audience? Just a couple. 
So just for orientation, these are clavicles. These are ribs that go along here. This big white thing is the heart. This is part of the aorta. The lungs are black because they're full of air, and that's why they're black compared to some of these other organs which are white. Here's your stomach. It also has a little air in your stomach, usually, and that's called the stomach bubble. So these are normal lungs here. Down here is pretty normal, up here is pretty normal, and then the abnormality is, of course, circled, and that would be a pneumonia, relatively small pneumonia. He was given antibiotics by, in the emergency room for bacterial pneumonia, something similar to a ZPAC. I can't remember exactly what he got, but uh, for bacterial pneumonia. He had blood work done in the emergency room. It was negative for the valley fever. And he called two weeks later because although initially he felt better, he now felt worse, and he had a repeat chest x-ray. And you don't have to be a radiologist to see that this is much worse. It's a little denser, it's whiter. Uh, and so that was two weeks later. He had repeat blood work, and this is a thing that usually happens with valley fever, is that one test is not diagnostic. You need follow-up tests, you need serial examinations, and oftentimes very close follow-up to make sure that the disease does not progress and that it is getting better. His blood work now, that serology or those antibodies were positive for COXI. He was treated and he did very well over four months, was followed with x-rays, repeat blood work. Uh, but he did have a residual nodule or spot on the lung, which because we know in this patient he had valley fever, we're pretty confident that this is due to valley fever. And in a later case, we'll come back to that, which sometimes is not that obvious. So where does this uh, gentleman fall? He falls on the, again, Pneumonia with symptoms, 30%. Unlike the last patient who completely resolved very quickly, this patient took longer to resolve, and actually worsened before it resolved, required therapy, and now has a residual scar or spot on the lung that will need follow to see if it goes away. Patient three, a 67-year-old male smoker, long-standing diabetes, so a chronic disease that affects your immune system, high blood pressure, had a heart attack, small heart attack three years prior, and a little bit of emphysema. Uh, he had, quote, bronchitis for several weeks, and for the past six weeks um, was treated with prednisone and a few different antibiotics for what would be considered emphysema and exacerbation of COPD and emphysema type treatment. And then came to the hospital very ill after almost two months, two to three months really of not feeling well and getting uh, an inappropriate therapy. Came to the hospital very ill, and a CAT scan of the lung showed extensive pneumonia, which I'll show you here. This is a normal lung. Again, this is a CAT scan. CAT scan, unlike the x-ray, this CAT scan is a cut, kind of like we cut in half. You went to the magician instead of the physician. They saw it <laughs> this is what it would look like. So this is the trachea, or the windpipe. The lungs, which are black because they're full of air. This is the beginnings of the great vessels of the heart and a lot of um, subcutaneous tissue. These are, this is the spine. You can see this is markedly different. Really, the only normal lung is up here in this section. All this is inflammation uh, due to pneumonia. So very extensive disease, much different than the last x-ray I showed you where it's just one tiny spot. This patient required intubation, was put on a ventilator, went to the intensive care unit, because there was no diagnosis secured, he had what is called a bronchoscopy. Many of you are probably familiar with an endoscopy or a colonoscopy, recommended for anyone over 50 for colon cancer screening. This is similar, but obviously very different, in which we take a scope and it goes into your lung. And we sample the inflammation, and we also send it off for cultures. So it's a good way for us to, to get at what's causing these pneumonias. It's not perfect, but it's a good procedure and it's very safe. I also use bronchoscopy in my research laboratory in order to help further the study of fungal diagnostics, just a little bit. But because the diagnosis was not secured and the, no blood work was positive, we had to have invasive testing. The lung wash did show coccidioides or valley fever, the spherules that Dr. Gavinati showed you. And he was placed on intravenous antifungal therapy, but he got worse and died. <laughs> 
And this sort of illustrates how bad disease can get bad and death can happen very quickly. So that even though it's 5%, if you're one of the 5%, uh, it's not good. Um, just, just to distinguish that from some people with pneumonia will also worsen. This is somebody who came in with fulminant disease. He also had a lumbar puncture, had uh, spherules and, and valley fever in his spine and his, around his brain. He also had it in his blood and it grew in his blood. So very sick, very sick gentleman. And I don't want to end on a bad note, so we'll go back to a healthy patient. Patient number four, a healthy 60-year-old former smoker, concerned about lung cancer, and decides to go to the lung cancer screening clinic and pay out of pocket for a low dose screening CT scan to look for lung cancers. It's recommended, uh, very new recommendations that, and this will be important for physicians in the audience, but also for patients who may have smoked. There are recommendations, just like mammograms for breast cancer, pap smears for cervical cancer, there are now recommendations coming out for low dose CT scans for those who smoke and have risk factors uh, for lung cancer. So we're seeing a lot of these CAT scans in our clinic, uh, and the interpretation from this CAT scan was that there was a small lung nodule suspicious for lung cancer. That's not what you want to see under screening cancer study. And this is the nodule. It looks pretty benign enough. It's just a little spot on the lung. Again, this is the cross section. That's at the arrows is the uh, nodule. Doesn't look too scary. Nodules, as I showed you in patient two, are common. And if we have that story in which you have a pneumonia and it's getting better and you're left with a spot on the lung, then we're confident that that spot is due to a past infection. However, someone like this, who was maybe asymptomatic, had an exposure to valley fever, didn't seek medical attention. We don't know what this spot's due to. And he's a smoker, which always makes us concerned that lung cancer uh, could be a possibility. It's usually a benign course, obviously, in people with valley fever. These nodules with these spots may change shape or turn into cavities, but they generally stay the same or resolve over one to five years. Oftentimes, we have to follow with x-rays and, and examination. And again, unless it's related to coxie, it's very difficult to tell the issue of cancer. And when we went back and talked to this gentleman, there was no history of pneumonia or valley fever. The blood work for the, the serology was negative, or those antibodies to detect uh, whether or not they, he's been exposed to valley fever were negative. And so this ensued, a long discussion in my clinic ensues about what to do with these spots on the lung. And that usually center on risks and benefits of ignoring it, repeating CAT scans every six to 12 months to make sure they don't grow, biopsying them with a needle or simply cutting them out and getting rid of them. And some of this depends on the patient, their philosophy of care, uh, maybe our discussions and how I steer them with complications. These are relatively safe procedures, but some of them are surgeries. So the patient wanted it removed and it was a coxy nodule. And so even though he was happy because he knew he was a little, uh, had some buyer's remorse because he had some complications and was in the hospital for at least a week and had pain related to the surgery, so had a little bit of a longer recovery period. But these are the decisions that are difficult that we face in the pulmonary clinic. So this is a gentleman, if we look at our pie chart, who really had no symptoms, had a CAT scan for other reasons, looked like he had a residual of a, an infection, and indeed that's what he had. He did not have uh, a lung cancer. Good news. So just some conclusions. If a patient with coccidioidomycosis pneumonia is already improving, no antifungal therapy is indicated. These come from guidelines that Dr. Galgiani and myself have written, uh, but also uh, styles of care and, and things that we've seen over and over again. This is very much like patient one, who with a little bit of time got better. Therapy is indicated in those with persistent signs and symptoms of active pneumonia. This is very much like patient two, who came in had a small pneumonia, got a little worse, needed treatment, got treatment, and now has a, a little nodule or scar. Most people do well with or without therapy, but people can have severe disease and can die of severe infection. This is especially true for people whose immune system is suppressed, as I showed you in patient three. 
nodules are generally benign, do not require treatment, but we need to exclude lung cancer. When we have that very nice scenario where we know they've had an infection, great, but when we don't, sometimes we need to go to surgery to prove that this is not a cancer, especially in those with high risk. Bronchoscopy with biopsies or other procedures may be needed. And every time I see the word bronchoscopy, it reminds me of the research that we have ongoing uh, at the Valley Fever Center. And we're very interested in uh, diagnostics, how to diagnose Valley Fever more rapidly and hopefully get people treated more quickly than we treated. <laughs> so we have time for some questions, but I'd like to start actually um, Ken's comments about this problem of figuring out what a spot on the lung or a nodule is is a really interesting sort of situation. That that was uh, based on a national multi-site survey that the NIH funded. And they came out with some very uh, database uh, conclusions. One of the problems for us is that I don't believe a single one of the sites in that multi-site collaboration was in the endemic region for Valley Fever. Uh, it wasn't here, it wasn't Phoenix, it wasn't Bakersfield. Um, the major places that see a lot of this. And now these recommendations are, are being promulgated nationally. The, the, it's a, it's a, you know, you're going to find a lot of things when you do high resolution CAT scans, right? Almost everyone, if you're my age, gets a CAT scan, you're going to find something. So there's a whole lot of having to figure out what to do. And the NIH study um, showed a risk benefit to actually go do this. Um, and there's this idea of number needed to treat before you find something. And it's, uh, do you have it off the top of your head? With it? It's some small number. If you go after them, some percentage of the ones you find will indeed be a cancer. And if you take it out, you will have cured the patient. But if you're in this part of the country where there's so many more people that have spots on their lungs because of other things besides cancer, specifically the alley fever, that number to need to treat might double, might even triple. And um, Dan, you know, uh, I'm thinking of recent discussions about what should the NIH do about uh, about going forward with a study. Uh, and they announced the intention to do a study. And actually, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking that a very productive study might not be. Or one, one approach that's been suggested is we should find out if treating those early pneumonias with, with antifungal drugs works. We actually don't know the answer to that yet. We make judges, judgments patient by patient. But another possibility would be to take on this questions of nodules in the lungs. You, you've been thinking about this too. Uh, I wonder if you have any we've thoughts. Had actually, we've actually had an additional discussion on the nodule discussion of could they take the current data sets and then do a certain amount of data in, you know, Phoenix, Maricopa, you know, um, you know Tucson, FEMA, and bounce that off. Yeah, I'm still not sure what has the greatest, you know, value for us. It's it's a very, I mean, this is, I mean, what you're doing here is you're taking a lot of people that are feel okay and you're screening them. So there's a, and now you're screening them with high resolution CAT scans, which is radiation and cost for the procedures. And then downstream, when you find stuff, more care is being done to figure out what you found. And many of those people didn't have cancer. So that's the issue, is how to best use those tools to help the most people. And, and, and it would be fun to actually, whether retrospectively look at the data, or maybe collecting more data in the populations of ours uh, where it comes up, because it, it's, a, it's really spreading across uh, the uh, community in terms of the screening program. Do you have any thoughts about that? How many of these you've seen? I think you summarized very well the, the problem, and that is um, people who are asymptomatic are getting scans that are going to show past infections, and then if they have an abnormality, they're either going to get aggressive care, or we're going to follow them with more CAT scans, and that's, that's problematic. Um, we see, there's not a day that goes by that we don't have that discussion uh, with the patient about 
Valley Fever in general, and I'd say every week we talk about a nodule that either needs biopsy or, or uh, surgical removal. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big problem. The scope of it's pretty pretty large. Questions? Is a smoker's lung more susceptible to Valley Fever? That's a, that's a question for me. Yeah. So the question was whether or not a smoker's lung is more susceptible to valley fever. And that's a really good question. I can tell you that there are certain types of valley fever that a smoker's lung is susceptible to. One is called chronic cavitary. It's not that common, but because the lung has some distorted architecture, uh, it's followed with CAT scans. Even if you're, even if that patient is, is is not wanting to do surgery, if it gets bigger, sometimes they change their mind, uh, and so it's our duty to sort of uh, have some fidelity to that process and allow people to make uh, important decisions, not just at one point in time, but over the course of follow-up. Sir, did you have a question? I did, uh, and it was related to the same thing she was talking about. In a case where you had substantial scarring in the lungs, uh, I had a lung motion and I had I was in intensive care for quite a while. And so I had quite a bit of scarring. Uh, I'm currently still, and it's been over a period of the last couple of years, and I'm still uh, on fluconazole. You're saying that you probably wouldn't do that? Well, if you want to consult, I'll have to see you. <laughs> but uh, in general, it's a very difficult decision as to when to stop there. It's easy to start from here and take your fluconazole. In those patients who don't get better, or who are very ill, or we don't know why they might have disseminated, it's difficult to stop. And sometimes that means years of therapy, and again, long discussions about the pros and cons of, of stopping therapy. Blood work is often needed to make sure that even if you have a little bit of valley fever still there, that it doesn't reactivate. So those are discussions that um, usually I have with my patients. Yeah. Um, can I can I follow up on that for sure. just a second? Uh, would that be exacerbated by the fact that a person has a uh, an immune system that's not really? I I have a rheumatoid arthritis, and so I'm taking medication for that. Yeah, so that, that's complicating things quite, quite significantly. If your immune system is suppressed, sometimes people require lifelong therapy. At scans, even if you're, even if that patient is, is is not wanting to do surgery, if it gets bigger, sometimes they change their mind. Uh, and so it's our duty to sort of uh, have some fidelity to that process and allow people to make uh, important decisions, not just at one point in time, but over the course of follow-up. Sir, did you have a question? I did, uh, and it was related to the same thing she was talking about. In a case where you had substantial scarring in the lungs, uh, I had a lung motion, and I had, I was in intensive care for quite a while, and so I had quite a bit of scarring. Uh, I'm currently still, and it's been over a period of the last couple of years, and I'm still uh, on fluconazole. You're saying that you probably wouldn't do that. Okay. Well, if you want to consult, I'll have to see you. <laughs> but uh, in, in general, it's a very difficult decision as to when to stop therapy. It's easy to start from here and take your fluconazole. In those patients who don't get better, or who are very ill, or we don't know why they might have disseminated, it's difficult to stop. And sometimes that means years of therapy, and again, long discussions about the pros and cons of, of stopping therapy. Blood work is often needed to make sure that even if you have a little bit of valley fever still there, that it doesn't reactivate. So those are discussions that um, usually I have with my patients. Yeah. Um, can I can I follow up on that for sure. just a second? Uh, would that be exacerbated by the fact that a person has a uh, an immune system that's not really? I I have a rheumatoid arthritis. Take the medication for that. Yeah, so that, that's complicating things quite quite significantly. If your immune system is suppressed, sometimes people require lifelong therapy. That doesn't mean all the time. It means that you have to make sure that you have to follow the blood work, uh, follow maybe imaging, 
Uh, and especially if you're on therapy and it will stop and you're thinking about restarting it again, uh, sometimes people will leave you on therapy. This is a little bit style of care, not a lot of evidence right now as to how to handle those, but Dr. Galliani can weigh in. And not to monopolize, uh, but one more follow-up question. Sure. In your opinion, uh, the, with extensive uh, scarring or nodules, whatever, in the lungs, would that necessarily affect your vital capacity? It would? It, it can. Um, on breathing tests, Yeah. for example, yes, it can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would like to tell you that back I can share it July. Those three things. How do we educate our friends and neighbors? Um, number two, how do we educate the medical community? Uh, my wife runs a big surgery center, and we've had conversations with her docs, and it's fascinating. How I many they think they know something about it? And a lot of what they seem to know is also wrapped in folklore. But our probably our biggest project is being able to help. Um, Dr. Galgiani and some of the others out there with the CDC, with the folks in Atlanta, with a lot of the federal medical research bureaucracy, to actually get them to pay attention to something that's going on to us out here in the West. Uh, you know, how do we get the compounds? How do we get it in priority? How do we find money to, you know, find a better test? Um, I think we've had, and I gotta tell you, I think we've had more progress in the last six months than we probably had in the previous few years. Um, so please, if you have an email list, if you have those things, share, as you collect the information, share it. Um, it. It's probably the smartest thing we can do to sort of help our friends and neighbors. So, you know, it goes on. Thank you, David. Appreciate the comment. So let's resume. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my very good friend Lisa Schubitz, a veterinarian um, who's worked with uh, both experimental mice, uh, mouse models of valley fever for many, many years now as part of the valley fever vaccine project and other activities, and also is a practicing veterinarian who has you know clinical experience with this disease. Um, and her topic is the pet connection, valley fever in animals. Lisa. Thank you. Um, I'm fortunate to working with Dr. Galdiani and uh, found a niche in valley fever that I actually didn't know very much about before I worked with him, in spite of the fact that I grew up in Arizona. So this is Jackson. Jackson came to me last January or so, having failed treatment with Mucomazole for a respiratory valley fever infection. And Three drugs later, under my care, oral drugs, he still was not getting better from the valley fever. And we went with um, an injectable valley fever medication. We were down to scraping the bottom of the barrel of valley fever medication. And here he is in the hospital getting amphotericin B, which is the last thing that we really realistically had to give this dog. And uh, the New York Times showed up and wanted to do an article on valley fever in animals, and so Jackson's kind of famous. He's, he's one of the faces of valley fever that's helped raise awareness of this disease in animals and humans. And um, he did actually go on to get well, which is good, the good news. But it shows that this is a really big problem in animals. So humans and dogs are really constitute the vast majority of cases of valley fever in, in, in mammals, which is where valley fever shows up. We don't see this disease in birds. But we also see valley fever in llamas and alpacas. The South American camellas are exquisitely sensitive to the disease. Economically, they're not extremely important because we just don't have that many of them out here. If you're an alpaca llama or alpaca breeder, it's kind of important to you. We see occasional cases in cats and horses. We see about one case in a cat for every 50 cases in dogs. And when they come in, they're extremely ill. So we'll actually see some pictures of these in cats. Horses don't really cross my office door. Um, and horses, obviously, they get infected and they mostly clear infection 
Um, but occasionally, they be, they're clinically impacted by this disease. Non-human primates are very susceptible. In animals, they're primarily limited to zoos, so this has a big impact on zoos. And there's other exotics, also include zoo animals. Green mammals are another animal to get infected with it. And uh, so obviously, this part of going out over the ocean, it's been found in sea lions, dolphins, and sea otters. Well, this guy, this is our local polar bear, or Tucson Zoo. So, the vast majority of all the infections that animals get are breathed in. Very rarely, an infection can be acquired by direct injection, meaning uh, perhaps they uh, got a spore into a wound or something like that. But generally speaking, the spores enter the animal body because they breathe them in. And it, regardless of where they end up, in a bone or in the eye or the brain, they usually enter by way of the lungs. This is true of humans as well. You've probably already heard that though. So, and as in humans, the primary disease that dogs get, um, dogs, okay, so, look back for just one second. The, the, the most of the rest of this talk is going to focus on dogs, as I told you. Um, most of the cases are in dogs, the most economically important species. And we'll see a little bit about kid cats, um, because the other sort of pet animal that is um, relevant from a veterinary medicine standpoint, small animal practice. But economically speaking, the dog is most similar to the human and has, it has the greatest economic impact on dogs. So, primary pulmonary disease is really common in the dog. And they present with this, with some or all of these symptoms, coughing, fever, lack of energy, lack of appetite, weight loss. They're actually pretty similar to what people get. And not all the signs are always present. They may present with only some of these signs. And then for cats, this is not the typical presentation. Only about 25% of cats are taken to the vet and diagnosed with valley fever because they have respiratory signs. By the time a cat goes to the vet for valley fever, it's usually gone someplace other than the lungs, and they're taken to the vet for another reason. <coughs> So this is what valley fever pneumonia looks like in dogs. This is a sort of run-of-the-mill valley fever pneumonia. And you don't have to worry about this, but this is infiltrates in the lung, infiltrates in the lung, infiltrates in the middle of the lung. Lots of pictures. I didn't want to bore you with too many details. So valley fever can get worse in the lungs and not respond, kind of like the picture of Jackson that ended up in the, with the Amphitaris and being in the New York Times. So this is a dog where it's, there's fluid around the lungs and the dog was taken to the hospital because it was having a lot of trouble breathing, the respiratory rate was rapid, um, and you can't see the heart in this dog because the fluid's filling around the lungs. This is a dog with very, very, very severe valley fever pneumonia. Um, they're almost all white everywhere. So this is what we call progressive lung disease. It involves most of the lung or thoracic cavity, so this outside the lungs of the thoracic cavity. And generally speaking, these dogs are responding poorly to our typical oral medication. These are the kind of cases that end up coming to see me in most, most of the time because I do consultations on valley fever cases only. So this is the kind of stuff that comes through my door. Typically, these are handled very easily in an ordinary, regular, this is the kind of case that will ever, you know, one of these walks in the door of a veterinary practice every single week in Tucson, Phoenix, and Castle. That's how much dog valley fever there is up So disseminated disease is what we get when the valley fever leaves the lungs and goes 
someplace else in the body, gets outside the lung. <coughs> this may occur without any previous history that the owner has noticed of a respiratory infection. The dog may not have coughed, it may not have had a fever, it may have skipped all of those signs on the slide that I showed you three slides back. This is not very uncommon. It, it's, we see it a lot. The symptoms are related to the organs infected, so they can be highly variable. But in dogs, the most common thing is lameness. This disease has a predilection for the bones in dogs. And where belly fever disseminates to most commonly is variable by the kind of animal infected. Okay? And these animals, they may or may not have a fever or any other signs of valley fever. They may have some lung disease or, or they may not have some lung disease. Most commonly, these dogs just have disease in a pitiful and they don't have it in their lungs anymore. It's come and gone in the lungs. In cats, the most common place for this disseminated disease to show up is in their skin. They have non-healing skin leaves. And often they've been to the vet two, three, four times. They've been on antibiotics, and the lesions don't get better. And eventually the vet biopsies the lesions, and the valley fever is diagnosed by biopsying the skin lesions. So this is why only 25% of those cats have lung diseases is the present with this disseminated form, not even skin lesions. <laughs> Other things, they may have generalized weight loss. This is common in cats. Um, seizures, if this disease goes to the brain. Um, it has a bit of a predilection for testicles in the dog. Though, what, 80 or 90% of our dogs are neutered. Um, but if you have intact animals, this, is, this can be a problem. Um, painful eyes and blindness, it can go to the eyes in the dog and make them blind. Draining tracts, again, it can be in the skin and it can cause oozing lesions. Um, subcutaneous swellings, which can go along with these draining tracts. And um, the dot, dot, dot is because we can be here all day making a list. It can go almost anywhere. And veterinarians have a pretty high awareness of this, so it's kind of always on the list of possibilities of weird things in Arizona. This is what disseminated disease looks like in the bones. This is a normal bone. Everything's nice and smooth. White on the edges, a little bit gray on the inside. This very rough, swollen-looking mess right here is a valley fever bone lesion in a dog. Uh, this is the knee joint in the back leg of a dog. This is a kitty cat. We don't see tons of bone lesions in cats, but this just happens to be a cat with a bone lesion. Uh, probably a very long-standing bone lesion. Uh, this is the elbow joint. And again, um, we've got some smooth bone up here, and this is a very rough, this is called a proliferative bone lesion. It's making a lot of bone here on the edges. Valley fever does this really well. And this is a very sore, lame kitty cat. One of the reasons cats get presented to the vet very late is they have a tendency to sort of go under the bed and hide and not tell you they're sick. So they kind of um, don't let you know they're ill. Dogs will just run around the backyard and carry your leg and you know that they're lame. This is a cat. I told you cats don't get very much valley fever, but it's really dramatic when they do. So I have really amazing pictures of cats with bad valley fever. This is underneath the tongue of a cat. This would be essentially um, a, a subcutaneous unhealing lesion, even though it's inside the mouth of a cat. And this is another one right next to it. This is the upper gum of a cat. This is the pad of a foot. And this is right behind the shoulder blade. This is all the same cat. Basically, everywhere we put a needle in this cat, he had valley fever, including places like his liver and his spleen. And he lived about two years with amphotericin B, intraconazole, you name it, he got it. And eventually his kidneys gave out from all the drugs and he died of renal failure. This is another cat. And this is a giant belly fever mass in the front of uh, his chest. This is his heart, this is his lungs. 
Um, and this is pressing on his airway, and the cat was presented on emergency because it was having a very difficult time breathing. This is a dog, two-year-old dog that came in with cluster seizures, again on emergency. And this white lesion right here is a valley fever lesion. These come on very acutely, and there's usually a lot of swelling around them, so these dogs um, are usually seizuring really badly. And um, they, they often come in on emergency, and usually with no prior history of seizures. Talk a little bit about diagnosis, just a cute factor for you. So when it comes to diagnostics, it's not always completely straightforward. And um, there's usually a battery of tests that need to be run, and it usually batters your checkbook for you. So there's usually some blood tests that need to be run, some generalized blood tests, and the vet learns things from this. So they run serum chemistries and complete blood counts. Often these dogs will have elevated white blood cell counts, which are an indication of infection. And they have increased globulin protein, which is a fraction that's associated with the animal making a lot of antibody. The antibody doesn't really help to fight the infection. It's just an indicator that the animal is trying really hard to fight the infection. Cats are a real secret about this. Their blood changes are not helpful in diagnosing this infection. Imaging, I've shown you lots of pictures of imaging and how helpful that can be in diagnosing this infection. So x-rays are really useful for looking at lungs and bones. I think they're extremely important because they give the veterinarian something to monitor besides these relatively vague things that are going on up here. CT and MRI, um, they're critical if you need to look inside of the central nervous system like the brain or the spinal cord. Um, occasionally they're used to look at lungs. It's much more common in humans because this is kind of a high dollar test for looking at thoracic cavity in animals because they have to be anesthetized to do it. <coughs> Ultrasound can be useful if you have to look at abdominal organs or take samples out of them. Um, or if you need to collect samples or look at lymph nodes inside of the thoracic cavity. <coughs> Valley fever serology test, this is a blood test, it's non-invasive. It's kind of the backbone of valley fever diagnosis in a definitive sort of way. If your animal has valley fever antibodies, test for antibodies, along with lungs that look like valley fever and an elevated white blood cell count with some globulins, that pretty much leads you very strongly in the direction of making a diagnosis of valley fever. So this is a pretty important test that we use a lot of in veterinary medicine. Um, people talk a lot about titers. Veter veterinarian will talk a lot about titers. If the test is positive, they use the titer often to try to tell you how sick your dog is and if your dog is getting better, if the titer is getting lower and things like that. Other things they call this are a COXI test, a COXI serology, or a valley fever blood test. And then other laboratory tests that are a little more, um, they require some collection of samples. Cytology and histopathology, these are things that require that um, a needle be used to collect um, fluid from a, you know, from a draining lesion perhaps. Histopathology, something may need to be cut out like those draining lesions on the, those skin lesions on the kitty cat. So these are samples that are collected from the patient, so this is a little more invasive. And they're sent to the laboratory for examination and they look under the microscope to see if there are valley fever organisms in tissue. This is, this is more definitive. Okay, if they see these organisms in the tissue, um, they can say with quite, quite good certainty that the animal has valley fever. And then finally, fungal culture. If they collect these kinds of samples, tissue samples or fluid samples, and send them to the laboratory and they grow the fungus and identify it, and it was in your animal, that's a very definitive test that says your animal has valley fever. And then things like, you know, negative blood tests and whatever don't really make any difference anymore. It's pretty well negated by the finding of this. 
<clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about treatment. So I showed you a picture of this dog with um, fluid around the lungs, and this animal did in fact go on to get better and resume its active life. So treatments that we use, um, these three drugs are oral drugs, and this one, fluconazole, has been the most commonly used drug for the last, uh, well, the last 10 years for sure. Um, 